right, well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Grant Sanders. For those of you that haven't met me yet, uh, I'm really excited to be here uh, and to be uh, teaching God's Word this morning and to uh, be here in worship with all of you guys. Uh, so I've been on staff here for about five months now, and so I've gotten to know some of you. I haven't gotten to know every single one of you. That would be a very uh, difficult thing to do because there's so many of you, but I thought this morning I would... Uh, Instead of starting out with a three-point sermon, I'd start out with three points about myself, if that's all right. Three things that I think are essential that I think to know about me. So the first thing is that I am a diehard hockey and blues fan. Is anybody else with me a blues fan in the house? Yes. So I like a lot of sports. I love baseball and I love football. But the thing about hockey is it just brings out something else in me. You know, I can watch baseball, and I like the Cardinals, but I can root for other teams, too. You know, I just enjoy watching the sport. But with hockey, I am a diehard Blues fan. I hate every other team in the NHL with a passion. I love the Blues so much. I want them to win. I hope they're going to win it this year. They probably aren't because they haven't ever won it, but I always have that hope going in every year. I, so the first thing is, is I'm a huge Blues fan, so if you're a Blues fan, come up and talk to me, and we can connect on that. The second thing is my favorite restaurant, and this one might be a little bit of a, a controversial one. It's not, the typical, um, it's not the typical answer we have here at church, but I am a huge fan, and I think the best restaurant is Raisin Cane's. Now, we all know that Chick-fil-A is food sent from God. It's God's gift to us in the form of delicious fried chicken sandwiches, but I think personally that Raisin Cane's is just a little bit better. They give you a lot more food, it's less money, and you always leave Raising Cane's feeling, why on earth did I do this to myself? But it was so delicious in the process of getting to it. So if you ever want to get lunch, let's go to Raising Cane's. I think the closest one is like St. Charles. So we'll make, a, we'll make a trip out of it. And the third thing is, is that music uh, is really my passion. As my wife can tell you and my family, anybody in my family can tell you, I know too many things about too many useless things when it comes to music. I can tell you anything about the bands that I'm listening to right now that you'd be like, why on earth do you know that? Why does anybody need to know that? But music is just where my passion is. I love talking about music. I love learning about the different bands that I like, and I love going to see them live. I've seen one of my favorite bands, U2, three times. It should have been four, but the other one got canceled. And so I'm a blues fan. I love Raisin Cane's, and I love music. But here's the thing, is there's a difference between knowing about me, I could tell you a lot of things about me, and you could tell me three things about you. Any of you could tell me three things about you, and I could remember them, you know. It's like, oh, well, that's Susan. I, there isn't no Susan here. I'm just making her up. Susan loves to quilt. And, you know, she could tell me two other things, and I could tell her the three things that I just told you. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we know each other. We can know about each other, but not really know who each we are as people. You know, there's a lot of things in our culture that kind of go, there's the knowing about, and then there's actually knowing and understanding it. You know, a lot of videos, if you scroll through Facebook or if you're on YouTube, you see a lot of videos that are kind of like these really well-edited clips of somebody doing something really cool, and at the end of it, you're like, wow, I could totally do that. I saw a video the other day of this guy made a guitar out of a bunch of colored pencils, and it was edited together really nice, so I was like, oh man, that doesn't seem that complicated, you know? It's like, I think I might try that. But the thing is, is we can think about that, but not really know all of the hard work and the skill that it takes to masterfully make those things. And that's the way it is with any art or with any sports or with any hobbies, as all of you would know. There's a difference between knowing about what you do versus actually understanding how it works. It's like whenever you get a new job, they can tell you in a job description of, what you're going to be doing, but it's a very different monster whenever you get in there and actually get in the trenches and start working. And so this passage that we're going to talk about today deals with the concept of knowing about versus knowing and understanding. And so this morning we're going to keep going in our rejected series, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 13, as we've been talking about the people that Jesus has um, interacted with that are really kind of rejected from society. And today we're going to look at the story of this woman that was overlooked, but Jesus did not uh, overlook her himself. So we're going to start in uh, chapter 13 with verse 10. And so this is Jesus here. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, 
And there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Now this is a really cool instance of somebody being healed here. Jesus does a lot of healing here. Um, but So Jesus was in this synagogue, and so he would have been invited to teach. It's kind of like if whenever... You know, somebody like Ben Merrill comes in or uh, Daryl Bolin that came in around Christmas last year that Gustavo invited them to come and teach in his place. So Jesus would have been kind of like the special guest teacher for the day. And they would have been meeting on the Sabbath, which we continue with that tradition today with gathering here on Sunday. This is kind of us continuing the tradition of the Sabbath. And this was the holy day for the Jews. And so the visiting teacher would have been asked by the ruler of this synagogue to come teach. And so that's what Jesus is doing in this instance. Now, the kind of ironic thing here is that Jesus does not have a great relationship with these rulers of the synagogues. These would have been like the religious leaders of the day, the local religious leaders. And so Jesus has had some uh, butting of heads, if you will, with these leaders in the past. If we look back to chapter 6 of Luke, we see that Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath, and they were upset about that because the law of the Sabbath was that you're not supposed to work, and in their mind, Jesus was breaking that law, but Jesus kind of pushed on them and challenged them. And so this is the, not the first time that Jesus has clashed with them, and so he's kind of come back to see if their hearts have changed or if they've thought about any of the things that he's told them. And now we get to the woman here who had this disabling spirit. We don't really know who she was. That We don't get any indication um, as to who she was or what she did. But we do know that in that time, unfortunately, being a woman and having a physical ailment such as this would have made her an outsider on two accounts. It's unfortunate, and that's how it was in their society, that women were not treated um, on the same level and that having any kind of disease or physical ailment or anything abnormal really kind of ostracized you from the rest of society. So this woman would have probably been going to this synagogue for a long time. People back then didn't move. They didn't change where they lived that much. This woman was probably going there for at least the 18 years that she had this, if not her entire life, most likely. And she's able to just slip in the back and nobody says anything to her, really. She comes in late while Jesus is teaching and so this woman would have been overlooked and ignored by a lot of people in that time. And so her condition, here's that, she, it says that she had a disabling spirit for 18 years, and she was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. Uh, obviously, we don't have the uh, medical, same medical terminology that they did about 2,000 years ago, but what seems to be the consensus on this is that her spine would have been fused together, and so she would have bent over been bent over and couldn't stand up straight. If any of you have had back pains before, have continuing back pain, you know that if anything deals with your back, it is extremely painful, and it really inhibits you in a lot of ways in normal life. And it says here, too, that she had this spirit of disabling. And so that term is kind of confusing because of how Jesus interacted with her. You know, our first inclination is to think that, okay, this had something to do with, like, a demon possession, but Jesus... Didn't, inter didn't normally, if there was someone that was possessed by a demon, he did not lay hands on them. So that's kind of out of it. Plus, she didn't have the marks of somebody that was demon-possessed. She wasn't making a ruckus or trying to confront Jesus or calling him out on any things. So it's not necessarily a demon possession that was the cause of it, but at some level that this, uh, this disabling spirit was the work of, of Satan keeping her bound and keeping her separated from trying to keep her separated from God you know trying to use that condition to put a wedge between her and God but it also separated her from the other people in uh, the congregation at their synagogue you know that would have created some tension there that she wouldn't have been able to connect with people as much and ultimately this is a showcase of how much of a grip that Satan can have on us in our lives whether it's physically whether it's spiritually whether it's emotionally or mentally, that Satan can kind of have these grips on us sometimes that make it hard to connect with God and to connect with others. But the awesome thing about the story is it's not just that this woman came in and 
she was just there and then Jesus finished his story and left. No, Jesus heals this woman, which is the awesome, great part of the story. And the even cooler part about this is this woman would have been overlooked by everybody else there, but he took the initiative to heal her. She did not come up, unlike most healing stories, she did not come up and try to approach Jesus. She may not have even known who Jesus was, but Jesus saw her and he took this opportunity to heal her. And so he heals her and immediately she's made better. It's not like a gradual over time. It's immediately she's able to stand up straight after being bent over for so long. And the seriousness of her condition here really highlights how great Jesus is and how great the cure was here. And the word here is that he didn't just heal her, but he freed her from this spirit that had been tormenting her for the past 18 years. So this woman is healed. She has a new wind, a new breath of life in her. And her reaction is twofold here. She does two things. Is the first thing she does is that she straightened up immediately. You know, she shot right up and her condition was completely healed, which is awesome. And that is definitely the work of God. But the second thing here is that she praised God. She did not say, oh, thank you, Jesus. That was a great healing, great prophet. She knew immediately that this was an act of God, that this was something that God had done. And the key is God here. And this is a great story. This is great news. You know, just imagine being there at that time. You know, you come in to listen to Jesus one morning. You know, it's this teacher you've heard about. He's not your normal teacher. You're excited to hear him. And you see this woman coming in that's, you may know who she is, but you haven't really talked to her that much, but you know she's had this, uh, this spirit over her for the past 18 years. And so she kind of sneaks in, but Jesus calls her out, calls her to the front, and he lays his hands on her, and he frees her from this. It would have been such an awesome sight to see and to be there with it. But unfortunately, not everybody saw it this way as we pick up in verse 14 as we continue in this story. But the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. So we see immediately that the ruler of the synagogue, the guy that had invited Jesus, that knew of his abilities, is really upset about this. It says that he's indignant to what Jesus has just done. And we don't necessarily know why he reacts this way. It could have been that he felt like Jesus was kind of stealing his thunder. You know, he would have been the ruler of the synagogue. It would have been like, if some great preacher came in here and like stole all of Gus's thunder and everybody was really excited about him and I know Gus wouldn't react that way but that it would have been kind of the same idea or maybe it was that he had the zeal for the law which we'll get to here in a second you know he may have been trying to stand up for the law here and he may have just felt out of control of the situation you know as the ruler of the synagogue it would have been up to him to make sure that there was an order to the service. He would have been in charge of everything that's going on. So maybe he felt out of control of the situation. But most likely, it was probably came down to his stubborn unbelief in who Jesus was. He refused to accept that Jesus was who he said he was. And that's what made him angry. And so he's looking for a way to kind of call Jesus out or to bring Jesus down a little bit. And so the ruler doesn't even say anything to Jesus. It would be one thing if he came up to Jesus and said, hey, why did you do that on the Sabbath? That would have been, I think Jesus would have probably answered his question there. But he doesn't do that. He does what a lot of us do whenever we're confronted with something, is we end up going behind that person's back and complaining to somebody else. So it's almost an aside to the crowd. He goes off and says, oh, well, yeah, Jesus, you know, he should have healed her on a day that wasn't the Sabbath. You know, it shows that there's already a strong reaction to who Jesus was amongst the Israelites. And it shows that Jesus was already dividing among those in Israel over who he was. This leader obviously did not think that Jesus was God, whereas the woman definitely knew that Jesus was God. But what objection did he actually have here? I'm not going to bore you with the specifics. I looked into this and my wife said it was really boring, so I'm not going to indulge you on 2,000 year old Jewish law but the, the gist of it is there's the law of the Old Testament that was given down by Moses these were the laws that the Israelites were supposed to fulfill that separated them from the rest and kind of showed that they were gods 
Okay, so these were the laws that they were supposed to fulfill. Fulfill. These leaders decided, you know what, we're going to take this a step further. We're going to have the law, like, right here, and we're going to build a huge fence around it. So we're not even going to get close to it. So the law that this guy is referring to, he's referring to the original of, you know, do not work on the Sabbath. But the laws that they would have followed then would have been these, these 39, which, who can remember 39 laws, right? Like, I couldn't tell you 39 laws of the United States off the top of my head. But... They had these 39 laws of things that you weren't supposed to do on the Sabbath. That's kind of the gist of it, is he's trying to say that, oh, well, you broke one of these rules on the Sabbath. And so did he have a valid argument here? Did Jesus break any of the laws? And Jesus didn't. Jesus did not break any of the Old Testament laws in this passage. He did not break any of the original Mosaic laws that the Jews were supposed to fulfill. Jesus violated the later commands, the 39 commands, and uh, that good Jews in that day were supposed to fulfill, but he didn't break any actual laws. They were just stipulations that they had put on there. And so this ruler seemed to be trying to protect the law, but in reality, he's just here trying to discredit Jesus. He's trying to throw Jesus under the bus and say, this guy broke the law, but he has no valid argument here. And so this ruler, he knew the law of God. He knew what you were not supposed to do, he knew what you were supposed to do, but he really missed the heart of God here. This great thing happens, this act of God happens, and yet he misses it because his heart is not in the right place. He knows the law literally, but he does not know the meaning behind the law. He completely ignored the good that was done in this situation, completely overlooks it because his heart is so hardened by the law. He had interpreted the law literally, but missed the most important thing, which is God in the law. And he became like a lot of us whenever we start focusing on knowing about God versus understanding who God is. We can get so caught up in what we should and shouldn't do or what should and shouldn't happen with following God that we miss God behind the law. We miss the purpose behind the law. We become satisfied with only knowing about God. And for those of us that have been Christians for a long time, we know that this happens sometimes. It's not necessarily an all-the-time thing, but we know that there are times where we, you know, we think we kind of have that checklist of, okay, well, I've gone to church this week, I'm doing okay, but if we're just doing the things, but we don't have any any love for God behind them, then they're pointless. They don't mean anything. And that's what this leader was doing right here. You know, he was doing the right things. He was like, I'm obeying all 39 of these laws that we made up. But he's missing God in this. He's completely ignoring the point of God. And it's kind of like knowing somebody, like I was talking about earlier. It's kind of like they knew the three things that they could tell you about God, but they did not know about God who God was. They didn't know him as a person. And so in verse 15, Jesus has the solution right here. He picks it up with, then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? And so Jesus calls out this religious leader. He knows that he has no argument here and calls him out. He called out the leader and all of those that were agreeing with him. The leader knew the law, like we said, but he did not know the heart of the law. He knew the literal laws of, you know, we need to keep the Sabbath. But he also didn't take into consideration of the other parts of the scripture that kind of told about who God was. Like in Isaiah 58, where God talks about that we need to be humble when we're fasting and just doing things that God asks us to do is not the same as having the right heart behind it. Or in Micah 6, 8, where God calls us to act justly, love mercy, and to walk humbly. If we don't do those things behind the, what, we're suppo- what Jesus has called us to do, if we don't have that heart there like they didn't, then we're in trouble. And on top of that, these rulers even broke their own rules that they're accusing Jesus of. Jesus makes this parallel of that these rulers, these people that made a big fuss about the stuff that Jesus was doing on the Sabbath, they broke their own rules by they would go to their livestock and they would let them drink water on the Sabbath. That was something you were not supposed to do in those 39 
rules. And so they're trying to say, oh, well, Jesus, you healed. Jesus is like, you feed your animals on the Sabbath, and yet you're going to be upset because a woman was healed from something she had been tormented by for 18 years. They treated their lesser things, they treated their livestock, they treated their property with greater care on the Sabbath, and they cared about that more than they cared about this woman who had been struggling and overlooked. The synagogue ruler probably overlooked this woman and ignored her himself, you know? He may not, if his heart was in this place, he wouldn't have had the heart for her in the first place. They would be humane to their animals on the Sabbath, but not to her. And that re Jesus really gets to the heart of the Sabbath here. It's not rigid. Following God is not just a rigid set of rules that we're supposed to check off. You know, it's not man for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath is for man. We're supposed to use these things to enjoy our relationship with God. And the Sabbath here is about being set free. Jesus frees this woman, and that's what the Sabbath was for. That was what it is celebrating. And so here, Jesus calls us to recognize the difference between knowing about God and knowing God. There is a huge difference here, but it can be deceitful. You know, all of us, myself included, we can sit in church every week, we can go to our Bible studies, we can read scripture every week and become hardened to the good things that are happening around us. It doesn't matter how much we know if we don't know the person behind it. You know, of all people that should fall under that, myself would be number one on this list. I grew up as a pastor's kid. I think I've missed maybe 11 Sundays in my entire life, which is kind of crazy for me to think about even. And I even saw kids growing up myself that they would, you know, their parents would force them into church every Sunday, and they never got it. I know a lot of people who I grew up in youth group with or went to Sunday school with that they knew about God. They could tell you about God, but they never knew God. And so now they don't acknowledge God at all. They're off doing their own thing. They're struggling with drugs. They're struggling with all sorts of things that if they knew who God was, I don't think they would be in the same spot. You know, and the temptation here is that we value things and ideas over people and over the heart of what God's looking for. You know, we value justice in God. We value, well, this person didn't get what they deserve. This person hurt me. This person you know, deserve something worse than what they got. We ignore the grace of God in that situation that he's given to all of us. You know, we can become entitled where, oh, well, we point it back at ourselves where it's like, oh, well, I don't deserve what's happening to me in my life, even though things happen to everybody in life and God has his grace on whom he has grace. And we don't see God working because it's not working in the way that we expect it to. You know, we become comfortable of, well, I think I'm doing pretty well. I don't need to go talk to that person. I don't need to give money to that. I don't need to go outside of my comfort zone because I think God and I are okay. You know, we put our comfort above people. And we put our own standards of what's right and what God can do and our own standards and expectations over putting our standards and expectations through God. And so to finish up this story in verse 17, we see the final reactions to what these people have heard about what Jesus has responded with. And he, as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the things that were done by him. So this reaction here is pretty strong. His adversaries were shamed by this, and the people rejoiced. You know, there's two very clear indications as to how this can turn out. You know, we're either our hearts are hardened and we will become ashamed whenever we realize that we don't know who God is or we're going to rejoice in God because we know who God is. And so if you feel like the religious leader, and this is the camp I fall in a lot of times too, is that how, and the biggest way that we can look at this and kind of gauge whether or not we're the religious leader is to look at our hearts. You know, how do we react to those that are overlooked? You know, we need to do a heart check here of like whenever something good happens to somebody, whenever God has grace or God has mercy on somebody, are we upset by that or do we kind of have stand, our own standards that we filter it through? Do we think to ourselves, it's like, oh, well, that person did something really horrible. I can't believe that they didn't get what they deserved. Or are we upset with how things in our life are being handled because we don't see the way that God is working his good things? 
when rules and regulations dictate our mind and our heart, we are on the wrong track. We are on a fast track away from God whenever we put our own rules and regulations and what the rules of the Bible are even above who God is. And so ultimately, we need to say, see people the way that God sees them and the way that Jesus sees this woman in this passage. You know, we can do a lot of, you know, we might not be able to heal people physically like Jesus, but we can do a lot of spiritual healing in people that are overlooked if we refuse to ostracize people who are overlooked and we treat them with love and respect like Jesus treated this woman. But we can't do that if our hearts are hardened and blinded by the rules instead of the person of God. But if you feel like the woman in this story, if you feel like that you are overlooked and that you're kind of separated from either God or from your family or your friends or even this church, we have hope in Jesus. And I know that that's not the immediate situation. You know, God isn't necessarily going to always heal you physically or mentally or emotionally or spiritually. But we see from this passage and from Jesus healing people all throughout this book of Luke that Jesus cares about those who are overlooked. He cares about those who are rejected from society. He cares about the Samaritans. He cares about the tax collectors. He cares about the sinners. He cares about the Gentiles, those who are out of the Jewish faith. And we all have things that Satan tries to keep us bound with. Whether it is a physical ailment or whether it's a sin that we struggle with or whether it's an emotional issue or whether it's people issues. We all have things that try to keep us bound, but we have hope in Jesus. We may not be healed from it. It may not go away in this life, but whenever we choose Jesus, we will be free in the Father ultimately. We're freed from the things in this world that tie us down, and we have hope somewhere else. And so as the band comes back up, and as we finish this up, whether you feel overlooked or whether you feel the need to have a heart check Today is the right place to do that. Today is the right place that if you're overlooked and you need Jesus, let's spend some time and reflect and pray in that. If you feel like your heart is hardened, let's spend some time and reflect and pray in that. Pray that God would soften our hearts. Pray that God would heal us spiritually, that he, we would become his. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray. Father, thank you so much for given us this gift of Jesus that uh, and for this awesome story that we have of Jesus and uh, looking through the book of Luke that Jesus cares for the people who are rejected in this world Jesus cares for those who are outside of what society thinks is normal so Jesus is, cares for we feel that way God and so I pray that if we are have hardened hearts this morning. I pray that you would soften our hearts and that we would feel led to uh, come back to you, God, and that we would feel led to, to pursue you, that we would not just merely know about you, but we would seek to know you as a person. And God, I pray that if there's anybody in this room that feels overlooked, and I know there are people in this room that feel overlooked in one way or the other, God, that they would look towards you and know that you have not forgotten them, you have not overlooked them you have not rejected them but know that they can be or that they are yours god so thank you for all that you do for us and i pray that this would be a time where we can point our eyes back to you so i pray amen